Here's for the dogs. Okay, while this is booting up, um, our, our uh, cosmonaut friend talked a lot about policy instruments and about big data and about all the, the things that are driving us at the moment. And these, these are actually things that I'm going to include in my talk. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about um, providing not just the open standards, not just the open data or the open source software, but also the open science. So I'd add that to that list of all the open things that we're talking about. Um, my name is Stephen Ramage. Um, I was, back in 2006, an early OSGO Foundation sponsor. Not me personally, but the company I work for. And, and I've kind of watched this development since then, and it's quite staggering, I think. If you look at what Malcolm Gladwell writes about, I think we've probably reached a tipping point here, which is, which is amazing. Okay, that doesn't seem to be working. I just go this way. Anyway, I have the same, the same statement that was put up earlier by Vasily, um, talking about um, what Skylar had said and then what Phos4G had built on top of that. Um, unfortunately, Skylar, I didn't put in your uh, macho photo with the, the vest. It's a beautiful photo, though. Um, but I did add a quote after it, um, which just reinforces, I guess, what Gio is trying to do. I mean, Gio has been around for more than a decade. And Maria was talking about not knowing how big the, the whole FOS4G and the OSGO community is. We have the same issue with Gio. Um, we represent over 100 countries, and it could be anywhere between 600 and 1,000 national government agencies. Now, when you think about some of those agencies are, are, are NASA, European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, Ministries of Environment, National Statistical Offices, Hydro Met Offices, is a very, very large community. So I'm speaking on behalf of that community because that's who GEO represents, that's why we exist. We're there to work on behalf of those governments to explain to them the value and usefulness of open earth observations, data and information, for research policy, decision making, and most importantly for action. So there's been lots of stuff done in GEO over the years on research, and now what we want to do is move that much more into policy making and into action, especially when you hear about all the things that are happening, if you've read the IPCC reports or the IPBIS reports, or the stuff coming out of, of the Convention on Biological Diversity. There are so many drivers that we need to address. How are we getting on? So when we talk about Earth observations, we talk about anything in, on, or around the Earth. So in this case, we're not just talking about satellite imagery, we're also talking about in situ data. So we're talking about soil, soil moisture, groundwater, um, ocean buoys, or, or buoys if you're American, and all these different things that you can measure um, using sensors. Oh, rebooting. And what we're trying to do, or what we've been trying to do for, for over a decade is to... Okay? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so let's see how accurate I was guessing what I was going to say. <laughs> um, okay, so the bottom one, open data, open software, open standards, and open science drive our work. For data to be meaningful, it needs users and trust. That's kind of a reflection on what's said above, but it's also a reflection on what is actually happening in GEO right now. And this is what I'll talk through. So this is what I was saying, that it's anything in on around the Earth. That's what we talk about as Earth observations. And these are what are, are, are kind of... Um, oh, that's interesting. Okay, well, those little squares on the left actually said areas for FOS4G contribution. So for those who, who... Somebody's encrypted it, so you have to work it out. But anyway... Um, it's, uh, we, we exist for the members, we exist for the countries, and that, that, those, are, those are who pay us. Nobody else gives us any money. All our money comes from countries, over 100 countries. 
And we work with what are called participating organizations. And hang on, I think I'm being tweeted because my phone is going nuts. <laughs> Put it down there. Um, we, we exist for, for, the, for the members. We use what are called participating organizations, which is essentially a fancy name for partners to support work with the members. And we've just announced an associates category, which is to bring in not-for-profit, civil society, private sector, uh, non-governmental organizations. So that's something that I, I would, that's my first call is to say that's available for, for everyone who wants to contribute. We've been working on this global Earth observation system of systems for, for a decade, and we've created the GEOS infrastructure, which some of you will know about, but that needs to move forward, and part of that is we've been creating a knowledge hub. And so that's one of the areas where there's, a, there's another uh, contribution possibility. And then within our work program, I've, I've read through the different um, people who are going to speak. I've seen there's agriculture, biodiversity, disasters, climate, energy, all these different areas. So I've picked out some of the areas of the Geo Work Programme where I think there will be relevant activities for this community. And then, oh, so those are, those are the things we work on, that's why I called it operational. And then in the long term, we're trying to respond to these policy instruments, to these policy requirements. So looking at open data and open science and also doing capacity development. So I've put the things in red where I think that FOS4G and free and open source software for, for geospatial can contribute to the work of geo globally. You probably can't see it now, but you, you'll see it when you take the slides. Um, so these are some of the things I've already talked about. Um, we have 73 work program activities. Now that may not look like a large number, but some of these work program activities have 100 different organizations in the community. So GeoGlam for Global Agricultural Monitoring, GeoBon for Biodiversity Observation Network, GFOI, the Global Forest Observation Initiative. So these, these are within, it's like a network of networks. So it's a very large network that we operate under. And um, we have 132 of these, what are called participating organizations, which are the partners. What I draw your attention to is for every single aspect of the work program, there's an implementation plan. So I'd encourage you to read the implementation plan. Trust me, it's smaller than reading the GML spec. So, just. <laughs> um, but you can, you can go in, you can read them, and it talks about the funding, it talks about the policy mechanisms, it talks about the contributors, and it gives you the contact persons for each of the initiatives. So I wanted to raise that. Um, in the GEOS infrastructure, we have 163 catalogues, which equates to about 7,000 data providers. And that's providing 400 million open data, uh, earth observation, uh, open earth observation data and information resources. So really what we're trying to do, if you look at the bottom here, we're trying to, we've been working on the availability and accessibility for many years. We've moved into the integration and usability phase and what we want to get to is the action, impact, and value. We're not there yet, but this is where we're trying to go. So this is kind of the roadmap of what we're trying to do. To do all of that, we need a framework. So the framework is around these policy instruments. So the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, the Paris Agreement for Climate, and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. More recently, we've been approached by UN Habitat to look at um, SDG 11 and the new urban agenda. So how can we use Earth observations to inform the policy making and decision making around that? So some of the uh, activities we're doing, this is working with UN Environment. We've put together the methodology for 6.6.1, which is about the spatial extent of water. And so in here, we've worked on the methodology. We've looked at within the UN system, there are different levels of, it, of tiers for the indicators. So we've been working to move it from tier three, which is not really recognized, no real methodology, no real standards, to tier one, where all those things exist. If you look at the bottom uh, bold point, they're now looking for guidance on EO fit for purpose data sets, tools, and platforms. So I see that as an opportunity for this, for this uh, community. Work that's been done here, so taking, um, Gesundheit, taking the work here, um, this, is a, this is work of the Open Data Cube, and what they've done here is they've taken some of the, that methodology in the code, and they've put it into the Open Data Cube, and they've been able to use something called uh, water observations from space. So they've used that algorithm to work against the SDGs using that methodology. So that's, 
that's something that's happening now. That's an area where you can, you can learn from or you can contribute. Same thing looking at 11.3.1 um, and 15.3.1. Here you can see the QGIS plugin. You can see what they're doing with trends.earth. Um, we're also working with MapEx, uh, the World Environment Situation Room, um, named as the, the Weather, um, which you won't forget. So the links are there to, to explain what we're doing there. Again, in the Open Data Cube, um, we've put in uh, for 11.3.1, which looks at the, the population growth against land use. You can see how it's changed over time. And then, um, also working on, on the land topic, we were approached by UNCCD to look at how could we address challenges for land degradation neutrality, so land use and land change. So we created three working groups around capacity building, around data quality standards, and then around data analytics. Again, if you look at where I've highlighted the last point, they're looking for open source solutions to assist the countries. So they want to scale this up to the 194 countries in the UN, and they're looking for help to do this. So these are all part of the GeoWork program. These are activities that are underway there. Um, and again, in the Open Data Cube, um, work that's been done to put the, the methodology and the data into it uh, for SDG 15.3.1. So for those who are new to EO or who maybe haven't quite got what I'm saying, these are some of the things that we're tracking using Earth observations. So it's all about the change over time. It's all about temporal monitoring. So assessing climate change, tracking urbanization, flood monitoring, drought and water resources, and many, and many other things. But one of the areas where we're working is, and this is very topical, is wildfires. So if you look at what's happening in Siberia and parts of Africa and Amazonia, we've been working under the auspices of one of the geo um, work program initiatives with NASA, with the Joint Research Center and with others to build a global wildfire information system. So again, this is an area where people can contribute. Geo-Human Planet Initiative, has the global human settlement layer and other open data, um, uh, open access from the, the GRC, where we're looking at how do we do this measure, understand, and communicate human presence on planet Earth. So this is in the Human Planet Initiative. Here you can see a number of different expert groups led by different institutions and different people. So that, this just gives you a feel for the scale and the scope of some of the activities that are going on. The second Human Planet Forum will take place uh, at the end of October in New York. And again, I just put that out because it shows you the number of contributors and the different types of organizations that are engaged. So in terms of the work program, we have a number of different flagships. Um, I put this one in. Uh, this is the Biodiversity Observation Network. So for those of you who are interested in the Convention on Biological Diversity, on the work of ITBES, on essential biodiversity variables, this is where that work is being done through Geobon. So like I said, there's over 100 different organizations who are already in that network. And I'm putting all these up so you can come and talk to me later or so you can go and look at the work program yourself and see if there's areas you can learn from or areas you can contribute to. GeoGlam is another one. Uh, this is Global Agricultural Monitoring. And they started off with a mandate from the G20. And what they were asked to do was to look at crop monitoring um, across the world. And so they've been doing that. And as a result of that, they ended up doing early warning systems as well. So this is an example of impact. This is what I was talking about. This is where we want to get to. So using the data from GeoGlam, they were able to assess that there would be a crop failure in Uganda. This triggered disaster risk financing from the World Bank, which then provided funding to help support almost 32,000 households. So 150,000 people were supported. We don't know what the impact would have been if we hadn't, if we hadn't supported them. So this is, really, this is really important in terms of that impact that I was talking about. Um, AfriGeo is a framework, so there's a regional geo in, in, every, in every world region, so AfriGeo covers the, the 54 countries in Africa. We have Digital Earth Africa that's just been launched. So this is starting to get into the realm of some serious money for geo. Before we used to do things in the sort of 300,000, half a million range. Now we're looking at doing things in the $50 million range. And so this is something I've been heavily involved in, trying to raise money for. Uh, we've got the first $18 million, and I'm hoping we're going to have another $15 million to announce in the next three months. So this is starting to become something re really real for GEO and really changing the landscape for us. AmeriGeo has a platform, the AmeriGeos platform, which again is like a mirror platform of the GEOS infrastructure. Uh, we have AOGEO for the Asia Oceania region. Again, looking at, I've put in the different tasks they're focusing on here. So things like the Pacific will be a big focus area for them going forward. Data sharing, data hubs, data cubes. 
um, they're all key, key aspects as well. And then Eurogeo, um, Copernicus is, is often called the European contribution to geo, so the billions that have been invested in the open data there, which also you know, obviously complement the, the huge amount of work that's been done by uh, Landsat over the years as well, in terms of open data. So this is the associates category. Um, Vasily's pushing me to get through this. So um, I'll just explain, this is one of the things we've started with uh, AWS, um, and if you read Paul Ramsey's blog, other um, platforms are available. Um, but we've done this to lower the barrier of entry for our countries to use cloud services. So they're under no obligation. It's a three-year program, and they can claim up to $100,000 worth of free credits. Then they can just walk away if they want. But this is a really big contribution from Amazon. Um, and it's been done for developing countries. So it's to help them start to get into this open science and start to really use the cloud services that were talked about before. So a lot of work has been done here already on the Open Data Cube and the work that we've been doing with our, our colleagues from um, CEOS and from the Australian government. I, I just realized Frontier SI is maybe not entirely government, but they've, they've been a big part of what, what's been going on here, along with Geoscience Australia and CSIRO. So we've been moving from, as I said, the first decade was all about open data, and now it's about open science. It's about reuse, redistribution, and re reproducibility. So being able to reuse the data and the methods uh, in an open science context. So this is really what our new director has brought in. He still codes in a number of different languages, which is quite quite weird for our director, given we're like really all about policy. But he's he's leading the science agenda at Geo globally. So that's really good because he's working with our program board and and with others who've been building the Geos infrastructure for many years. So the driver for this change is all about taking everything that comes out of GEO and providing access to it for everyone else. So the methods, the code, the models, the source data, the papers. Um, I don't know why it doesn't like anything I said about FOS4G. I'll try and fix it. It's probably some code, but anyway, um, I'll try and figure out. But that was me saying this is another area for contribution because it's all about, the Knowledge Hub is all about taking the papers, the in-situ data, the code, the cloud data and the results. And what they said on the left is we're looking for more people to contribute in R and Python. So I saw there was an R spatial session by Nicola, can't remember his second name, tall French guy. Um, but that, that's the kind of thing, and, and the stuff that Vincent Saratoga did, those are the kind of things that we'd like to do webinars on so we can highlight to our community what's actually happening in this area. Okay, this, <laughs> this, there you go, there's the architecture. Um, what this is basically saying is that you can still go through the GEOS platform, the GEOS infrastructure, the Knowledge Hub is in the middle and you can access it through the website and everything's shared across each area. But you can come and talk to me if you want to get more details. Um, this is where we're going to, um, we really want to make it all about reusable shared knowledge using cloud and crowd. So it's not just about satellite imagery, but it's about the in-situ observations as well. And it's really about empowering the practitioners. The garbled squares there say trust is key. So that's really for us, it's all about trust, whether it's trust in the data, trust in the software, trust in the methods, trust in the people. That's what we're trying to do. So to do that, it's about the open EO data, it's about co-design and co-production, and it's about these robust and reliable results. But really what we want to do is we want to strengthen institutions because people change jobs, people change positions in, in organizations, and, and people retire and do other things. So really we want to strengthen institutions. So with no further ado, um, this, is, this is what I'll leave you with. Um, I'd like you to look at the GEO work program, I invite you to see there, see if there's things that you can offer to it and see if there's things you can learn from it. Um, we'd also can, we'd like to encourage you to contribute to the Open Data Cube because we feel that's something that has a bit of momentum but could really, really grow a lot. And, and we're going to have someone at the Secretariat purely working on that, dedicated on that. So we'd really like to encourage that. Um, and then you can follow us on Twitter if you want to get updates. And then I just, you know, I just want to say I'm really proud. I've been around the world with my T-shirt and so now I get to wear it in front of you finally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you.